Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's football show sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Tam McManus and Alison McConnell here with me on this Monday. Great to have your company. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page. We'd love you to do that. Hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel and you'll be off and running with the football family here talking about the weekend's football and looking ahead to some of the fixtures coming up this week. We'll also be discussing the emerging stories in Scottish football today. Uh, first and foremost, let's say congratulations to St Johnston. The first time in their history, Ruffy, they've won the League Cup. Yeah, I think they deserved in the end of the day. You know, I think they were the better side. I think uh, Livingston tried to resort to the tactics that uh, it's been successful for them. You know, long throw-ins into the box and... Evan getting piled into the box, but it didn't work because I think St. Johnston were very, very well organised uh, from day one. Uh, and, and I thought the first goal was always get, going to be important. And St. Johnston got that. And I think at the end, you know, they, they deserve to win it. Yeah, um, it was just one goal that decided it in the end, Tom. But uh, to be perfectly honest with you, um, St. Johnston, I thought throughout the 90 minutes, played the better football. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Ruffy. I thought St Johnson deserved to win it, Peter. I thought that uh, from the start of the game, they looked the stronger side. Uh, and I always felt as well that it would be tight. I think the first goal was crucial. I think it's crucial in any game, but in a cup final, it gives you something to hold on to. You know, and uh, St Johnson seen the game out very comfortably. could maybe have added it towards the end, but I think they'll be disappointed uh, with the performance that they put in. I think they're better than that, but I think St Johnson deserved it on the day. And congratulations to all the supporters. Yeah, it was an emotional day for the manager, Callum Davidson. Obviously, I'm not an emotional person, but it's probably made me a little bit emotional. I think uh, I'm just delighted for everybody involved. Uh, I think it's difficult times for everybody. And, you know, sometimes uh, the performance there, seeing them after the game, uh, all the staff, all the players, you know, a uh, pretty special moment. Uh, and hopefully people back in Perth and supporters and Johnston can, uh, can celebrate it and give them a bit of cheer. Yeah, the amount of St Johnston fans, Ali, who were out there giving it big licks on social media. Um, people I didn't even know were St Johnston fans were suddenly coming out with their, their strips and celebrating. It was just sad that they weren't able to actually get involved in it because when you look at uh, you know the, the, the last decades, they really have had some special moments. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a win to add to that to that previous Scottish Cup win, but it, it is a shame when you, when you think how rare it can be for some clubs to make it to Hamden and to get to a final, it is you do feel for supporters who didn't get their their day out and their day in the sun to go and to go and see it and to cheer the team on. You have to feel for them, uh, and in some ways, I think it's probably more emotional for for supporters than it is for players because if you have a a lifelong affiliation to a club and they go and and have a moment like that, I think it's special. And it's special when you're not picking up silverware every season. When it's when it's something that these players might only do once in their once in their career. It's something to be celebrated and to be relished. So you, you've got to feel for for supporters who found themselves locked out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were a few shining lights in there. Rooney gets the goal. He's always going to be the hero. He gets the man of the match, um, Ruffy. Uh, but I thought the uh, I thought over and above that, if you're looking for someone to lead the line. Um, you know, Chris Kane, for me, held the ball up brilliantly. I thought he made a constant nuisance of himself and, and obviously brought his midfielders in as well. Yeah, I think in the last two or three weeks, he's been a star man for, for St. Johnson. I, I mentioned it on Friday. Uh, it would be a, 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 a tough one to pick who you would put up front. Obviously, he's not a big goal scorer, you know, but as you say, he causes problems. He's a handful you know, you've got to keep your eye on him and he brings other players into the, the, the game. But uh, certainly, no, I think in the last month, uh, he's been super for Sir Johnson. Yeah, the uh, opposition for me, uh, at times, I think they've got players that are capable of playing football, Tam. But, uh, you know, all throughout this season, every time I watch them, they are a hard watch. And I didn't think they had any real creativity um, in that game that... He, that suggested, I mean, apart from, you know, I think the, the, the shot early on, which produced a, a good save from Xander Clark. Other than that, I didn't think they really looked as if they were capable of create, creating something other than the big launch up the park. Yeah, I mean, Livingston, are, they're, obviously, they're, they're very strong at home. I think when you play on the AstroTurf, it's quite a tight, tight pitch as well. You know, you've got an advantage, I think, on the bigger pitch at Hamden. 
Um, it's it's hard that he bully teams uh, from set pieces and throw-ins. And St Johnson are a, a particularly big side as well. Uh, the, the three at the back uh, are very very strong, big big physical players. So I thought they stood up to what Livingston had to throw at them. Uh, handled it well, and I just thought they had a wee bit. As you see, Chris game was excellent. Conway guys like that they had a wee bit extra quality, I think, on the pitch, and I think that contributed to the result. But uh, no, fantastic for St Johnson. Listen, I think for Liam Craig as well. I played with Liam at Falkirk many years ago, and. He's 34 years old, he's never won anything. And uh, it's one of my biggest regrets that I never won anything. So to see him at 34 years old finally picking up a winner's medal uh, was fantastic to see. And he was very emotional. And, and that's something that you'll never forget. You can always say that you've won something. So I'm glad for guys like Liam Craig and Murray Davis and guys like that who've been there for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Liam's a brilliant lad, does a lot of great work with the uh, PFA in Scotland as well. Of course, for the losers, it's a hard one to bear. Uh, you could tell the emotion at the end of the game for so many of the Livingston players. But uh, David Martindale looked back on the game and said they've got to use that now as the motivation to make sure they're in that top six. If you can't take that in the chin and you can't sell for the flag and you can't use that as motivation going forward, I don't think you should be in Premier League football. So I'll definitely do that. I'll, I promise you I'll go home. It's done. It's forgot about it. I'll go in. I'll speak about it tomorrow morning. I'll go through an analysis with the boys. and We need we need to use it as fuel going forward to kick on and try and secure top six as early as possible. Well, we're about to find out how good a manager he is this season, Alison, because that's the first real kind of negative vibe around Livingston, losing a final like that, when really, if you consider the last three months, all it's been has been a, a roller coaster of fantastic press, people praising them, a great story that David Martindale had to tell about himself. Yeah, without doubt, but... I just wonder how much he might go back and have a look at himself. I thought the call to play Marvin Bartley out wide left and and try and negate Sean Rooney, I, I didn't think it worked at all. And I thought he might have changed it earlier, even when they got to the break. I thought he might have changed it around and and tried to have more forward impetus. I, I think they were they were spooked by the occasion. But I, I don't think they looked like the Livingston we've seen. In the last two or three months, I thought there was a real lack of imagination and, and I thought there was also a, a lack of belief about them too. Uh, other than that shot from Josh Mullen, early doors, I think in the first 20 minutes or so, that there just wasn't much else that came from them. And they've got players that have offered so much more, like Scott Pittman, Scott Robinson, that have offered so much more these last few months, but we just never really got a, a glimpse of it. And I think you might go back and think that they could have been bolder in the final, they could have had a wee bit more courage and they might have got something out of it because even in that second half, and there's only one goal in it, I thought St Johnson were dominant after the break, but one goal is always nervous, it's it's always precarious. Um, but you're right, I think it's been it's been all sunshine and, and roses up till now and it, it's a setback and it's how you come back from it now. They've, they've still got this top six place to go and aim for, which I think would be a considerable achievement, particularly given where they were when you look back in October. So there's still something to celebrate from this season. But I, I think it might take a while just to, to go over the ghosts of Hamden and, and just to ruminate on what could maybe have been done differently. Yep. Um, nevertheless, congratulations to St. Johnson. A great League Cup win for them. And that the amount of uh, tweets, I don't know if you've spotted them, Ruffy, the amount of tweets saying in the last decade they're the second most successful club in Scottish football. I mean, I, 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 they were just trying to ram the message home, um, St. Johnson fans. And of course, then there was the classic one, um, you know, to trolling Celtic saying we have uh, your League Cup now as well. All good banter. I, I, I don't mind that, Ruffy. Yeah, that was amazing. That start what was it twenty two cups and uh, you know Sir Johnston are, are second with two of them. You know it's absolutely amazing. But uh, you know it's, I think it's great for clubs like that. We always say it's good to to get the cups coming round and, and other teams getting sampling in it. And as we've touched on it, it's just unfortunate the supporters weren't there to celebrate because that's a big big miss for them. Uh, and I think it's good for Scottish football that we have other other clubs winning cups. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, every now and then, Ruffy has uh, enhanced his background. Alison has just got the the classic background now for uh, people who um, are intelligent with uh, lots of books in the background, you know. Um, Love them, mate. 
Well, of course, I, I know you, you bought them from a theatre company and got them shipped in. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> Alison, I feel as if Tam has really cranked it up today. Tam, you might not have won a medal, but I, I, I am almost certain that you are a guy whose glass is always half full because many a person might not have won a medal. But to have you know a chance to play professional football with all those clubs... Is, is a dream come true. Some people would give the right arm for it. And you were 40 at the weekend and the presence there, most people would die for that type of present. Yeah, Peter, listen, I, I, I never won anything, but I still enjoyed my career. I'm, as you said, I'm always quite happy anyway, quite a happy person. But uh, I, my wife done, uh, got my strips framed for me for my 40th yesterday, so that was a great wee surprise when I got up. Because uh, obviously you don't want to be spending your birthday in lockdown. Uh, couldn't really see any of my family or anything, but to see my, my strips getting framed and a couple of wee gifts, she got me, she got me, she got me the real earpods. I don't know if you've you've seen them. That's the real ones, Peter. Yes. Not a, a <laughs> so, uh, she got me them on all. <laughs> she says she was sick of the sick of the wire dangling, the wire dangling like you. So I've got good yeah. earphones and all. So no, I had a great birthday yesterday, and uh, thanks to everybody for the best wishes in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. And uh, you, she put a lot of work into it as well. And, and um, of course, the other thing about it... I, is I, thanks for you guys as well for your wee video. Yeah, thanks, well, I enjoyed I the wee video she, you she, sent me. That was great. She, did Tam keep his video clean? Tam Cowan absolutely roasted me. I swear to God, he's absolutely killed me <laughs> for about two minutes. And my mother... <laughs> oh, no. I, I sent it on to my mum, and she's like, ah, that Cowan. Uh, so she's in a bad book for my mum. A bit, a bit too much swearing for him. But no, I enjoyed uh, it. Thanks, thanks for all your messages. Just get that image in my mind, Tam, of just you uh, lying there in the middle of the living room with your wife, absolutely plastered this morning. Um, party for two. <laughs> There's nothing worse, is there? <laughs> was I? Oh, it was I. It was plastered, plastered last <laughs> night. Uh, plastered this morning, all. But I'm just, I'm just saying before the show, it's great. You need to get up to your work at half three, so it's not bad. <laughs> 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 Brilliant, Tom. Uh, okay, so from a, a man at 40 uh, to a, a team back in action yesterday, um, Celtic against Aberdeen. Um, it was a narrow one um, at the weekend for Celtic by a goal to nil, I uh, beg your pardon, on Saturday. Um, Edouard with a rather fortuitous goal. Is that fair, Ruffy? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, and I'm sure Neil <laughs> Lennon would be wishing he got a wee bit of John Kennedy's luck because I think if Lenny had been in charge of that game, it ended up possibly one each or two, one to Aberdeen because Aberdeen did uh, have certain uh, enough chances to take something out of that game. But you're right, it was uh, a deflected goal, but uh, where Celtic are just now, you'll, you'll take anything that's coming along. But again, I think Derek McInnes would be disappointed they never got anything, particularly a goal, you know, they'd certainly deserved it, considering the run that they're on, the, the one goal and what is it, six or seven games. So, you know, I think he, he, he knows what's up ahead. He knows he's got a couple of games coming up that could maybe push them a wee bit nearer to Hibs, but uh, he'd be disappointed he never took anything out of that game. Yeah, um, and of course, uh, John Kennedy, happy to get the win, but of course a few questions directed to him about um, Christopher Iyer. He reckons it's going to be really tough to hold on to him. Chris is, I don't think Chris you know, overly thinks about that either in terms of for him it's just coming in and doing the best he can wherever he is. You know, I've no doubt that there'll be interest in him you know, because when you've got good players like Chris, who's still a very young player as well international player, the profile he is with the speed and technical quality and the size there's going to be interest, no doubt about it but again when that, when that comes, it'll be the club and Chris and everybody else to make that decision. Yeah, um, wasn't a classic to talk about, Alison, but uh, I suppose they started to ask about players that could be moving on because I think the general consensus with Celtic is there will be a clear out. I don't think there's any doubt about it at all. I think Ayer, you could put your mortgage probably on it that you'll go this summer. I think um, I thought he was the best player on the park on Saturday. I think that ability to carry the ball out from the back, his versatility too. I just think he looks like a, a class player who, who's probably going to just go on and improve now. I, and I think it will be very, very difficult for Celtic to keep hold of him. One, because I think there will be substantial interest. And two, I think he probably wants to go and play at a higher level. But as you said, I think he'll be one of a number. I wouldn't anticipate that Odson Edward would be at Celtic next season and I think uh, I think what you'll see is a, is a whole clear out of players. I think there'll be a number who go 
and a number who come in. What I would say is that it's probably important for Celtic to keep hold of some core players. I think Callum McGregor looks like a Celtic captain in waiting. I think it'd be important to keep someone of, of his quality at the club. Uh, and Scott Brown, I think, is a player that could be useful too. When you consider the, the influence that he has in the dressing room, uh, even if it's to be a conduit between the dressing room and the manager, if it is to be some kind of coaching role as his playing days come to an end. But I think it would be quite important to, to keep some spine and and some of the the players who have been steeped in the philosophy and the culture of winning over the last decade to, to keep them on while this rebuilding process is going on. Would you give him another year, Tom? Brown? Yeah, 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 I would, I would Peter, yeah, I would. I think that, and I, I also think that he's, 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 he's quite comfortable now that he knows he's not going to play every game. He's not one of these players that he's not playing, he's going to be chatting the manager's door or, or spitting the dumb out in training uh, and stuff like that. He, he's aware of what age he's getting and, and he's slowing down a little bit, even if he can play 20, 25 games a season at Celtic, I think that'd be great. And as Alison said, I think he's vital. Listen, he's a winner. He's, he's won everything at Celtic. I think it's vital that, he, that new players that come in are made aware straight away of the standards and what's and what's required at Celtic. And guys like <laughs> guys like Brown and McGregor and Forrest who have won everything can can tell those guys, listen, this is the pressures we're going to be under. This is what's required. So I, I think uh, yeah, I would give Rooney another year, but I don't think he'll play every week. But I just think to have him about the place, I think it would be it would be great for Celtic. Mm, a strange situation, Ruffy, but all that talk about Sorrow coming in and the way he played, and then suddenly. Uh, you know, over the last two or three games, it's been brown all the way in that middle of the park again. Yeah, I think we all know. Like the guys have just said there, you know what <clears> what, <throat> what he means to Celtic, what Celtic means to him, and there's no doubt. And and uh, Scottish football, he can hold his own against anybody, uh, any of the teams in our league. I think it's the European games; he just gets caught out just a wee bit. But I think it all depends on the manager uh, with Scott Brown. I think it'll be Scott Brown that will decide. You know, we all know how much uh, relationship we had with the past managers, with Gordon Strachan and Neil and, and, and Martin and Neil, you know, and it was a big, big partnership. You know, they all bought into, you know, what kind of player he was and when he was needed. So I think it depends what manager comes in, whether Scott fancies him or not, or, or Scott gets on with him, because uh, the relation he had with the last three was, was fantastic. So I think we'll just have to wait and see who it is that comes in. Yeah, um, I think you're just overstating it there. Possibly two out of the three, Ruffy. Yeah. Um, the yeah. uh, other, uh, the other point I was going to, <laughs> the other point I was going to make is, uh, I think, I think he knows already who it is. It'll all be about just maybe having another Brendan Rogers style meeting, Tom. Yeah, possibly. You know, and I think that when Brendan Rodgers came in, uh, Scott Brown was was really struggling. You know, I, I felt as if he was near enough finished. Before Brendan Rodgers came in, he was getting a lot of injuries. And Scott Brown has never been a guy who got injured a lot. He was struggling with his hamstrings and his calves. And I don't know what happened to Brendan Rodgers. They had the meeting and uh, he, he got a new a little lease of life under him. And uh, he went on and was outstanding under Brendan Rodgers and played his best football, I feel, at Celtic. So it might take another manager like that to, to manage Scott well. But I think Scott's a brilliant guy. He's a good pal of mine. And I still think he's got a lot to offer at Celtic. I think he's a legend and the fans love him. So... I think he's he's vital that you maybe keep him for, for maybe another season. Uh, they got a narrow one 0 win. Aberdeen had chances. I mean, Ash Taylor had three opportunities to score a goal for the Dons, um, but there was various clearances and, of course, the woodwork denied him as well. As far as Aberdeen are concerned, it's still this battle uh, against the Hibbies. We'll talk about the High Bees in a minute. Um, but as far as the battle for third, Derek McKenna is still confident they can get there. Post split games is always where it sorts itself out. We've now got two games, uh, Hamilton at home and Dundee United, um, where it's important that we try and um, get winning uh, performances. Uh, and then we go into the post split games where they can be relevant. We all Celtic one, we need to deal with them at Pataudry post split. We need to play Hibs at Pataudry again. We, we'll be, uh, we need to make sure the next two games really decide the relevance of the post split games, but there's nobody in our dressing thinking thirds beyond us now. Do you think finishing third will be the determining factor in how much flack he gets, Alison? Because he's he's getting a fair bit of late, Derek. I'm not sure. I think it may ease some of it. Uh, but I think just the, the inconsistency of the campaign might raise question marks over his future. We've spoken about this before. I think he's eight seasons in that job at Aberdeen. I just wonder if maybe he feels as though it's time 
for a fresh challenge as though he, he, he's done everything he can. They have good resources. I think they should be aiming to finish third every season. I think um, they should be aiming for that and they should be aiming for, for some silverware from the Cups or, or, or a decent run in both Cups. I don't think finishing third will, will stave off all of the criticism just simply because of the manner of the campaign and, and the lack of goals and the lack of creativity at, at times that's been in the team. OK, um, so from Celtic and Aberdeen, um, we'll talk about the other games uh, that took place in the Premier League. One story that was doing the rounds uh, over the last 24 hours, Rafi, is you know, a new deal for Steven Gerrard, the Rangers manager, of course, Rangers in action in midweek. Uh, we'll discuss that, but uh, is it time to sit down and, and get him on a longer deal? Because you know, uh, some people, two and two makes five, Jurgen Klopp hits a sticky patch and all of a sudden he's leaving and Gerrard's going to be the next Liverpool manager, but I think he's maybe getting one or two years still here. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, everything that goes with winning the league will have a big bearing on that. You know, obviously, Rangers supporters and uh, the club itself, uh, I think you'll, you'll feel the magnitude of, of what they've just achieved from where where they've been. Uh, and that could be the reason. You know, I, think the, I don't think there's any hurry for the Liverpool one just now. I think if... Klopp is a, 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 a disappointing season. He'll want to prove himself next year. So, no, I, I think maybe a, a, another year or so, you know, of getting the success in Europe because it, you keep saying it's the success in Europe that's going to get them down to England, not winning our league because obviously the way they treat our league up here, they don't see it as high uh, as what it should be. So it's the Europe uh, one for me. If he was to take Rangers, you know, last eight, couple of years in a row or even further or whatever, you know, that would be the one if Klopp decides to go that uh, he would get that job. Yeah, uh, although let's not rule out, um, if he got Rangers, you know, semi-finals, possibly final. I know some people might look and say Rangers are not good enough to get to the final of the Europa League, but um, I, I can remember many a person saying Rangers weren't good enough to get to the UEFA Cup final in 2008, and they absolutely bludgeoned their way all the way to uh, Manchester. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility. If he did that, there'd be, I think there'd be a clamour of chairman beating down mm. the door at Ibrox to get him. No, I said that, Peter. I think that it all depends on the run. Uh, obviously, they're going to stop 10 in a row this season, which is massive for them. Great for his CV as well. But I think Europe, you know, and I think this Rangers team is a better team than the Walter Smith team. I don't know what you guys think, but I just think this is a better side. Uh, it's certainly better to watch uh, than, than Walter Smith. No, no disrespect to the guys, but I think uh, Gerard goes and sets his teams out. He's going to go win. Uh, he's going to open the, open the game up and, and, and go man for man. And he believes that they're better than the teams they've come up against. So, uh, I think if they get a lucky draw, a, a fortunate draw, Rangers, then they can get to the semi-final, possibly the final. I, I just think you need to avoid Man United. I think that Man United are, are the favourites to be the bookies, and I think they are the strongest team in it, the strongest squad. So I think if you can avoid them, uh, Rangers would fancy it against a lot of the other teams because they're playing that well at the minute. Tam, you know what I love about you? you, you sometimes you come out with just little golden nuggets that get me thinking. Yeah. And, uh, and as soon as you said it, I thought to myself, Wow, what do you think, a what do you think, Peter? Do you think? Well, I mean, I commented on that Rangers run all the way, yeah. every game, uh, to the UEFA Cup final in 2008. I mean, at times they were not good to watch, but they were dogged in their determination. I mean, uh, there's no doubt about it. In my mind, Ali Barry was a class act, Lee McCulloch was a top player, Whitaker was great. Um, Daniel Kuzan was in there as well, and McGregor was in goals. It's, it's such a good argument. I mean, I know lots of Rangers fans uh, might have their own take on that, Alison. It's a, it's a tough call. It's a great point by Tam. I would definitely go along with the fact that this team's far easier on the eye to watch. I think they, they've got more creativity, and I think they've just got a bit more about them in terms of, of looking to win games and leave their own stamp on it. I, I think that. 2008 team, no disrespect, but I think in that European run, it was all set up to, to negate the opposition and to, to try and sneak through. I'm not pouring any scoring on it at all. It worked. It was hugely effective, but I think this team is, is much more enjoyable to watch. Yeah. Ruffy? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good point. You know, if you were to go through, you know, man for man, you know, it'd be an interesting one to see who would get into what side. Uh, 
uh, and the guys are right. Barry's already said that's the way they played. They they, they made it hard to to be beaten rather than you know going forward and winning games. But uh, individually, it'd be good. Another dis- good discussion. You know who would get in that team, uh, the present team now. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a few places there where there's been, uh, you know, players like Barisic is an absolute stick on, you know, I think Sasa Papic might have been uh, the left back for Rangers at the time and he was absolutely an 8 out of 10 minimum every week um, for Rangers at that time um, Yep, yeah, great argument, Rangers fans what do you think, would you take this side over Walter Smith's 2008 UEFA Cup finalists, uh, give us your view on that, great point that you made there Tam um, might as well put you on a downer now Tam you might have that hip strip up there <laughs> you absolutely, you absolutely have done us all in for any points, I mean my God almighty. I mean, unbelievable rank rotten at the weekend. Motherwell 2 nothing. Well done, the well. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations to Murrow. I thought they were excellent on the day. Uh, Graham Alexander went with the three strikers. Uh, Roberts, Cole and Tony Watt. All three of them were superb. They caused Hibs all sorts of problems at the back. You know, too quick, too strong. You know, for, for McGregor and Hanlon, who have been excellent for Hibs. But uh, no, I thought Motherwell were excellent. Three guys in the middle of the park. Crawford. Uh, young Barry Maguire and Alan Campbell. You know, three in the park, three dogs in there, you know, and, and up supporting, you know, ran over the top of And they were solid at the back. Ricky Lamy, I thought, was outstanding. So I think most of the most of the good performances were, were in the Murrow jersey and they did thoroughly deserve to win the game. But in terms of Hibs, they were, they were terrible. You know, I, I could tell after the first five, ten minutes, Peter, you know, it was like, similar to the Hamilton game. You know, never get started. You know, never came out of blocks and Murrow came and they got confidence, knocking the ball about, getting in behind, a couple of chances. And uh, it was just it just continued. And for Christian Deutsch, you know, I think he's now twelve or thirteen games without a goal. Missed a couple of chances in the second half. Um, needs a goal badly, Peter. Uh, you know, missed a couple of good two good saves. You think with Liam Kelly probably Ruffy will, will, will might compliment the goalie, but for me as a striker, you've 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 got to be scoring at least particularly the second one. Maybe they gave Hibs a wee squeak, but uh, in terms of the game, Hibs were, were really really poor. And they've now got three hard away games. It's here, Derek McInnes here. You've got Ross County away, St Johnson away, and Livingston away. Before the split, uh, you would you would say on paper they'd be tough, but Hibs have been so much better away from home. They've been rotten at home, so I think a lot of Hibs supporters will be quite happy they're away. So certainly the race for third is not over yet, Peter. Not by a long shot if Hibs play like that. Yeah, Where, where's your money on? Because Aberdeen are not exactly <laughs> setting the head on fire. I know. <laughs> well, I'm going to stick with Hibs. They've got that wee point points gap, but you know some big games coming up. Hibs need to get back on back on the horse because they were uh, oh they were, they were really poor at the weekend. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing, Ali, and I've been singing his praises all this season. I mean, the ball that Tony Watt played through for Roberts for the first goal was absolutely top drawer. He is absolutely sparkling in that side. I think he looks like a player who's settled. I think he he looks as though he's comfortable where he is. He's had such a nomadic career up until now. He's never really stayed for any prolonged period anywhere. But I think he looks embedded in that team. I think he's enjoying that role of playing out wide as as part of a front three. Um, he, he's he's strong. We all know the pace that he's got. But I think he looks as though he, he he's maybe going to fulfil some of the potential that we've all known has been there. And I just wonder if the key to it is just feeling at home somewhere and and feeling settled and feeling relaxed. But well, well, I think Motherwell as a whole played very well on Saturday. I actually saw them the previous week and. And they were appalling. They were absolutely, they were dreadful against St. Johnson last Saturday. And I think that's what's been their undoing is just the, the, the failure to be consistent and to, to try and keep it going. That You can't really rely on what kind of Motherwell performance you're going to get or what Motherwell team are going to turn up. Yeah, um, in the end, they got all three points. We didn't get any for that one. Um, Kelly against Dundee United. For Kelly fans, Ruffy sitting in their house watching the game, couldn't have believed it. They managed to see the first goal since January the 30th. Yeah, you could see the joy in the manager's face. Uh, he was loving it, you know, when the, the, the goal went in, you know, and he'll be, he, he was right in what he said. It's a it's a step in the right direction. It's a point, you know, mm-hmm. and that's what Dundee United have been doing. They've been picking up points all season and, and getting themselves away from that relegation. So they've got a massive one in Saturday. Uh, I think it's Ross County up there. So he'll know the importance of that because, uh, you know, you don't want to get left down there that, Hamilton and them fighting it out. So, no, I, I think it was encouraging, and I think we all think we all know that Kilmarnock will get good players. Uh, it's just not been working for them. The confidence has been low. 
But that that may just give them the wee, the wee jump that they need. Yeah, one one was how it finished. It should have been two one to Kilmarnock in my view. And according to Tommy Wright, Kyle Lafferty's goal shouldn't have been chopped off. I'm going to look at that as a point gained. Obviously, we're disappointed we didn't get all three because the performance deserved all three. And you know, poor decision um, contributes to us not getting all three because you know Kyle's goal is a perfectly good goal. The goalkeeper palms it out and. Um, very little contact of any uh, from from Broadfoot, so um, it's a good point, particularly in the run that you know we're in. Yeah, Ali, there's no point in asking Ruffy because he's in that goalkeepers union and he'll give us the bog standard answer. I thought Kyle Lafferty's goal should have stood. The keeper didn't even have it in his hands, uh, and Lafferty dispatched it into the roof of the net. I thought it was a legitimate goal too. I thought the, the goalkeeper got away with it. I really did, um, and and as you say, it's it's a crucial couple of weeks now for Kilmarnock because although they'll take the point and they'll they'll be satisfied with it, I think it could have been a big three points if that goal had stood. I just you just see it; it could maybe have been the catalyst going into the the, the latter months now of the campaign. Yeah, and of course Dundee United were hoping to get down there and get the win, but Mickey Mellon uh, realizes not only is it two points dropped, but it's a blow in that race for top six. I think they both stand here and say no. Um, we had to probably come down here today day and, and, and probably win. Um, we knew that, so we wouldn't hide away from that. But we go in next week, we have never spoke about what we actually want to achieve. I've never said that. Some of you guys are all talking about top six and the rest, but we have never said that. We've said continuous development of this group, continuous development of the football club moving forward. I think Mickey's at it, by the way. He's, just, he's, re, he's rewriting everything <laughs> on the old top six banter. Um, I think he's trying to keep a lid on it continually, uh, Tom, just to try and take the heat off. Yeah, it's last night I think Dundee United should be targeting the top six. I, I, you know, and I, I don't care. They've just come up for the championship. We've spoken about many times. Peter, they've got international players and they've got a big budget. And uh, you certainly pay a lot more than the likes of St Mum. So I think that Dundee United would, would be disappointed. I think the fans would be disappointed if they don't get in the top six. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I think a, a top six place is probably the least that they should have been aiming for when you consider the budget they've got. I just think they've been undone too be, be what was a, a desperately inconsistent start to the season. I think uh, it just they were playing catch-up almost. At some point, but um, you would have to fancy St Mirren now to go and get it. I know they're only one win away, and I think they're at, they're at Ibrox next, so it's a fairly tough call for them to go there and, and try and get something. But I just think St Mirren look like a team just now with, with a bit between their teeth going into to what's a crucial stage of the campaign. They're the ones that I would predict would go and take that top six finish. Yeah, and a word for the keeper, Jack Annick. What a save he produced in the St Mirren game, uh, Ruffy. Absolutely magnificent um, to get them uh, all three points in that game. Yeah, it was a fantastic, it was a reflex save. I don't think he, he, he knew much about it. I think the centre forward, is it White? I think he'd have picked anywhere in the goal, but unfortunately he headed it right at him. But uh, you've still got to make the save. You've still got to... And there was a couple of uh, instances that right after that, you know, that... Uh, I thought Ross County were unfortunate not to get anything out of the game. I thought they had enough chances as well, you know, to, to at least get a draw. Uh, so they'll be disappointed in that one. But no, you St Martin keep picking up three points, you know. They, they'll believe that they, they can get there, but it's going to be a tough task. Yeah, don't yeah. be sucking up to Ross County now, by the way. It's a bit late for you just because they've been beaten by St Martin. You're offering them some kind of little... Olive branch, Ruffy. They're not having it up there. You'll never be able to get up to Dingwall for the next five years. Right. Damn. I've done it. I've done it. I'm not going back. <laughs> Peter, uh, Peter uh, it was never a penalty, was it? It was never a penalty. No, no, not a chance. Not a chance. I mean, never. And, but, 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 Peter, and the thing that annoyed Jim Goodwin, now, in the last few weeks, Jamie Murphy touched in yep. the box, went down. Greg Taylor touched in the box, went down. Jim Goodwin came out after the game saying we need to stop players diving. You know, that, that is a die for me, Peter. He's went down, yeah. you know, quicker than well, Ruffy's cooting. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> to be and fair, to be fair. What did Jim Goodwin say after the game? 
Well, to be fair, he has actually said he's going to punish Colin Kaner if um, it's confirmed he died for the penalty. So Colin, <laughs> let's come in. Colin's come in this morning, and Jim said to him, "Don't do that again, Colin." You know, <laughs> Don't do that again. <laughs> I'm talking you 10 quid. Um, absolutely. You know, you're right, Tom. And I think it's good that you pointed that out. Um, you know, double standards. But nevertheless, um, the good thing about watching the weekend's games is we have a team of the week from Gabriel Antoniazzi. Jack Alnick made a wonderful save to keep the scores level and earn his clean sheet. Jason Kerr lifted the cup on Sunday and was excellent all tournament. Liam Gordon may not be the skipper, but he leads the back three through his constant talking and aggressive defending. Chris Iyer was Celtic's best player on Saturday, and even John Kennedy admitted it will be a struggle to keep him. Sean Rooney was the Hamden hero again, scoring another thundering header. Cammy McPherson was the best player in a tight game in Paisley and made an excellent goal line clearance. Alan Campbell was industrious for Motherwell and dominated the Hibs midfield. Craig Conway still has so much to contribute at 35, and he put in an excellent corner for the only Saints goal. Jordan Roberts scored one and assisted another. He'll be a huge player in Motherwell's bid for survival. Kyle Lafty will make Killy stay up if he plays like this every week. He could have had two or three. Tony Watt is the Steelman's standout player and was creative yet again. Yeah, that's an attacking line-up there. Does anybody disagree? Is that, have we missed anybody out? Has anyone got to... Throw in a name that should have been there. I'm sure we could have had all 11 St. Johnson players. It was a special weekend. All of them, all of players. Absolutely. Uh, um, have so just before we get to uh, this news, breaking news coming out that I want to get Ruffy's thoughts on, uh, of course, the predictor, the head-to-head, and it's not looking good at the moment, I have to say. Suddenly, suddenly after a uh, just a dreadful weekend, here's how the uh, predictor looks with Ruffy coming up off the rails at 250. I'm only seven points ahead of him. And Tam, you are back in the lead. How do you feel? Oh, well, Jim White's back in the lead. I uh, wasn't. No, I'm delighted with that. Uh, just, uh, I, I didn't want Ruffy to have a good weekend, but and Big Ruffy's got his right back in it with a couple of great scores. So I, I think it'll go to the wire. Yeah, Ruffy, you did mention that, by the way. I mean, I'm a, I, I'm a little bit gutted. I was looking good at one point, and then all of a sudden, I thought there's never going to be another goal in this St. Johnson game. That's a, a stonewall certainty. You know, um, I'd, 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 I'm just surprised we let him away with a cup game. You know, it should be league oh, games sure. only. But we, oh. Because it's his 40th birthday, we go, oh, we go on there. There's five points. Ruffy, if he had done it in the semi-final, Hearts v. Hibs, it was ex- extra time. It's a good point. It's a good point. We're, 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 yeah. we're, we're, we're staff. You know, you're, you're a contributor. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well done, well done. He's feeling <laughs> right. Yeah, Tom, you're a valuable member, son. Uh, anyway, um, let's look at the uh, breaking story. This is um, still no clarification on the lower leagues uh, from this statement, as outlined uh, at the weekend by the National Clinical Director for Scotland, Professor Jason Leach. The SFA has been in regular dialogue with the Scottish Government since the temporary suspension of football was implemented on January 12th. The suspension was approved by the Board of the SFA against a backdrop of increased positive cases for COVID-19 nationwide caused by the new strains of the virus. Following a meeting with the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing, Mary Guggen, um, a temporary um, a suspension of all football was agreed, uh, encompassing all predominantly part-time tiers of Scottish football. Um, that was, of course, League One, League Two, Women's Premier League uh, One and Two, uh, the Highland League, the Lowland League, the East, West and South Scotland Leagues, Scottish Junior FA Leagues and the North Caledonian League. Since then, a series of discussions have taken place via video conference with all leagues affected by the suspension to establish the measures and protocols under which each might resume their competitions. This information has been shared with the government. While it's been positively received, we await a final decision from the Scottish government ministers. So, still in limbo, Ruffy. Yeah, I think that's the disappointing thing. Uh, it's just going on now, and I think it's dragging its feet. And I think we're now everybody's thinking the longer you drag it on, uh, the less purpose is to continue it. You know, I don't know if that's the that's the idea. But uh, as I said in the show, on numerous occasions, everybody wants to finish the season, uh, and that's the way it is. But I think the longer we go, there will be people 
certain clubs will be saying, like, what's the point? You know, what what's the point? You know, the longer you go, well, if you say you start training next week and then it's three weeks before you get a game and, and then you're into April and you've got all the games to play, it, it, it's just, again, lack of governance, Peter. It's lack of somebody uh, making a, an important decision, you know, and I, I, I thought the SFA were the ones that were making the decision. It now seems to be the government that, that's leading this one, but there's been no... There's no definite dialogue or, 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 or a hint of what oh, it might be in a week or a fortnight. It's just nobody's saying anything at all. And that, that's just a disappointing thing about the whole the whole scenario. Yeah, and with all the leagues, there is that frustration. And now there's a real feeling that the, the Scottish Cup might be binned as well. Alison, I noticed on the uh, BBC conducted a poll of 10,000 fans 38% um, want to scrap it. 37% um, reckon that the Scottish Cup should enter into a kind of a um, a finals format, much like a, a European Championship tournament. Um, continued into next season, 19%. Uh, and some of, obviously, the radical view, which is just throw out the smaller clubs and make it for the, bitter, the bigger clubs, which is... 6% of the, what I call the I'm all right, Jack Brigade. Um, <laughs> but um, nevertheless, Ali, um, what's your view on the Scottish Cup? I'd love to, to think that it could be, it could it could run its course and we have a normal competition, but we're in abnormal times. I just don't know that, that it's plausible. Uh, you've still got a, a couple of fixtures that have got to be fulfilled. It, I think first and foremost, everyone wanted to see the top flight reach its conclusion. Uh, I don't think anyone wanted a, a situation that we had last term. I think uh, we'll play the 38 games and uh, and we'll have a, a normal league campaign. But I, I think logistically it could be problematic to play the Scottish Cup games. Um, and you also have the issue now that you've got the European Championships too. So ele any elongation of the campaign is compromised by that too, which makes it difficult. And you would have to say in amongst all this discussion as well, uh, last week you had uh, women players, female players going off to play for Scotland for, for European qualifiers and albeit they were they were a dead duck because they were already out but had those been two live qualifiers they hadn't played any football at all since December when when again the, the league was put on hold and suspended and this is a, a group of professional players now you've got a, a few clubs in there that have, have turned professional and you had this odd situation where you were calling up players for a national team who, who hadn't been able to play any football since December. I think that there's all sorts of people that have been affected by it. And I think that the lack of clarity is something that would be problematic going forward. Yeah, absolutely. We'll wait to see if anybody's going to take the reins here and make a decision on not only the lower leagues, but the uh, Scottish Cup as well. Um, thanks to Jane Muir, who's posted a message on our Facebook page just saying, how is Charlie doing? He, he looked OK on Friday. Obviously, we knew that his first test was positive, but uh, I think he obviously had to wait to the second one and it ruled him out of the game in the 2-2 draw at the weekend, Tom. Yeah, listen, it's, 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 it's bad news, obviously, for Charlie. But I think he's been struggling. You know, I texted him over the weekend. I think he's, I think he's, he's, he's you know, he's struggling with it. You know, he's struggling to breathe yeah. and different things. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it, Charlie's a, a fit young guy still playing professional football. So if it's affecting a guy like that in his thirties, you know, people need to be careful. You know, it's not just one of these ones for over 60s, 70s. You know, young, 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 young men and women can get it as well and, and be really affected by it. So. Fingers crossed, I'm going to be drop Charlie a wee text tonight and uh, see how he's feeling. But no, he, he, was, he was certainly affected, but he wasn't feeling great at all. Yeah, absolutely. We passed on our best wishes at the weekend to him. He's usually, he's usually all over that WhatsApp group, Ruffy, but you can tell he wasn't 100%. It was all quiet. Um, missed out in the game. You know what he's like. He loves to play football. He wants to play every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, if he's got a positive test, then I think he'll be down for about 10 days, you know, having had it, you know, it just knocks you for six. So let's hope, and not just him, but his family as well. You know, he's got a couple of young kids there. So, you know, let, let's hope they're all safe and they're all, they all can get back as quick as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And nice of you to enlighten, Charlie, of what's coming up for the next 10 days, Ruffy. You're just a, an absolute barrel of laughs on this show. If it's any, uh, if it's any, <laughs> it's any consolation, you lose £12. 
Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, I'm not even going to go with a gag there, but um, I certainly could do with it. Um, anyway, apart, apart from anything else, I uh, I did watch um, I did watch Inverness Hearts. I wish I hadn't um, because it was dreadful. Tom Hearts are rank rotten at times. Oh, I mean, I I cannot believe what I was watching because uh, you know I'm kind of you know sometimes you accuse me of being pro Hearts, but I'll, I'll tell you this is. The, the Hearts fans I'm speaking to are not in any way enamoured by the way Robbie Wil Nielsen's team are playing. Peter, they're, they're, they're so bad to watch. <laughs> and every time I put something on Twitter, you've got a Hearts fan saying, well, they still beat you in the cup, which is fair, fair play. But the Hearts are they're really, really difficult to watch. They've got so much quality in their team. And they play as individuals, Peter. I think they're, they're, they're playing as individuals. They've got a lot of individual talent. They're not playing as a team. And they'll still win that league, Peter, because they've, they've got a big squad and a big budget. And to be fair, the quality of the other teams is no up to up to heart standards. So I think that possibly Wraith Rovers and maybe even Dunfermline could maybe maybe put a small challenge in. But Dundee won't. I think they're miles behind now. So they'll still win the league. But I think if you look at that team, Peter, if that squad was to come into the Premier League next season, I don't think I don't think you'd be anywhere near the top six, to be honest. No, no, you're absolutely right. Um, big decisions. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they play in the top flight and what type of player he's allowed to sign. Um, uh, thanks to Neil and a number of people who actually um, mentioned about the sad news on Peter Lorimer as well. Uh, Ruffy, I think he is now in a home. Um, for me, growing up, Peter Lorimer was a fantastic player for Leeds. I just have that vision of him with a number seven on the back, that classic Leeds United strip. And of course, the one thing that strikes me about Peter Lorimer, Ruffy, is he could strike a ball, um, I think he could hit the ball when they measured it in the 70s at 100 miles an hour, which some people take that for granted nowadays, but it was great then. Yeah, it was a big thing way back then, you know, how yeah, how hard, hard you could strike a ball, and he was he was up there, uh, he was a year just before me, but when you think of that Leeds United team, with all the Scottish boys in it, I think there's a 40 out there, that, uh, I think there was about seven of them. You know, and in, in, in a line, and that was where they got most of their success. But certainly, Peter Lorimer, for a wide player, you know, he'd everything, he'd pace, and as you say, that's that strike uh, that was very difficult to beat. Yeah, Alison, uh, sadly, that, that whole generation now, all we're getting is sad news about players who played in that generation. Gordon McQueen off the back of that, Peter Lorimer as well. And, you know, I think the whole thing really started to gather momentum when, the, you know, the uh, Jeff Hassel was the first one that really kind of came to the forefront um, to mention not only dementia, but uh, obviously Alzheimer's. It was just, it's tragic. It's just been one after the other. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I think uh, when you look at the body of evidence that's been presented now, although it's not as substantial as it will be in, in future years when scientists are allowed to do a bit more work on it, I think that the evidence is there. I think you can see that repeated he heading of the ball causes complications and, and brain issues further down the line. I think you have to take it seriously just now and I think it might mean some kind of compromise within the game coming in. I know people talk about the balls not holding the water like the way the old leather footballs did, but I think I think that's a misnomer. I think it's the repeated heading that causes the problems, it causes the issues, and it's something I know we've, we've seen that, that heading has been banned in, in kids' footballs under 12s, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a some kind of legislation that comes in that affects the, the game as a whole and how we view heading, because I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to ignore the links. I don't know about you, Tom, but certainly when I was growing up playing football, I went out of my way to avoid heading the ball, <laughs> period. As <laughs> soon, soon as I saw Thankfully. some big bruiser coming towards me, I thought, oh, you have it. <laughs> on you go, I'll, I'll wait till it's on the deck. <laughs> No, I mean, Ruffy's probably a better player than any of you. Know, Ruffy you know, played in the 70s. Uh, Ruffy, see, see, see in terms of the balls back in, like in the 70s, were they a lot heavier than the ones now? But like, was it substantially heavier? Right. Like a heavier ball? Yeah they, yeah, they were heavier, much heavier. They were the leather, you know, that on them. And, and even yeah. going a, another decade before, you had the laces on them, you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know how centre-halves did it because... A way back then, there was no build up for the back. There was no rolling it out and then building up. It was just a, a, a hoof up the park. And it's whatever centre half and what centre forward won the duel. Uh, I mean, Alison's right. You know, a way back then, it, it was all about heading. 
you know, it's how how if you could out jump the centre forward or he could out jump you, and it was just heading for well, not ninety minutes, but there's certain people on the part were heading more than others, you know. But uh, the the balls were definitely definitely a lot here. You wouldn't be kicking for kicking the ball out your hands as a goalkeeper. You'd be lucky if you just go over the halfway line. You know, whereas now you you can launch it as far as you like. It's particularly off the dead ball. But I mean, like, like Peter, here I'll remember you. Then you had the mold master. You know, the mold master. If it hit you, you, you were you were out for about two weeks. You know, it yeah. depends where it hit you. You know, and a and a winter's day. You know, you could be out for three weeks. Uh, yeah. but uh, it just depends where it is. Anyway. Well, 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 to be careful, honest with you, you're right, Rafa. You got I, I, I was out for two weeks because it was painful, and I also got a third week I was grounded because my mum thought I had a tattoo mitre on my leg. Uh, so, I mean, it was very, very difficult to play with it. Um, but apart from anything else, uh, the one thing that kind of really made it, you know, brought it home to me was uh, you, you meet Billy McNeil. And he was such a sharp character. Mm. He was great. He was great patter. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it, as far as football is concerned, just a, an absolute giant of the game. And to see that horrible disease just slowly but surely take the great man um, was an absolute, oh, it was heartbreaking. Uh, and I know that there are many footballers that so many fans of Scotland, Scotland uh, players uh, and right across the UK and across the globe uh, will look back on players that were just absolutely magnificent in this disease in later life just got a hold of them. It's, it's, it is heartbreaking. Um, so anyway, apart from that, just before we go, we've got a couple of things I want to get your thoughts on, guys. Um, one thing that has been doing the rounds, uh, and I wonder, Alison, um, whether you think it, it's something that we should embrace here. They're talking about making referees up to, to, to let them explain, similar to rugby, why they came to the decision. Um, and then, obviously, if they have to go and review it, fine. But then they explain it to the players. I'm talking about seven years away on this one. But, you know, I, I don't know. If they can do it in rugby, why can't they do it in football? I spotted it in an, an Australian football game where they explained it to the players. Is it just because they think football fans couldn't take the fact of a referee explaining why he's come to a decision? I think it's probably more to do with financial problems rather than anything else but I, I would welcome it first of all during lockdown it's been a, a bit of an eye-opener when you've been able to hear everything that's been going on in the pitch and I have to say I've been at a few games this season where that's been my biggest entertainment is listening to the chat between referees and players and and, and listening to the exchanges that go on between players it's um it's been fairly uh fairly quite an education let's put it that way so yeah I think it would be quite nice to be able to hear from, from that point of view. But, but secondly, I think you welcome any form of communication. I think uh, a bit of transparency transparency with the decisions that have been made and the reasoning behind them, I think takes out some of the, takes out some of the edge when it's something that you disagree with or, or when it's a call that you're struggling to see the logic behind. I think if you're, if you're hearing the referee's perspective as it's happening, it's maybe easier to understand why he's come to that conclusion. Yeah, uh, and don't forget, uh, quite a lot of people mentioning too is that the uh, just wondering if uh, uh, there's a poltergeist on the show, or indeed Ruffy's wife is now putting up a framed picture uh, in the other room. And I think it's fair to say, uh, I think it's fair She's to say, that, uh, some, something's happened. <laughs> That's another, that, was, that was option three. I didn't want to mention it, Tom, but she's been locked in. She's got she's got she's two of hers. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I could hear a you know, thumb day in a row. This is outrageous. Um, yeah, uh, Tam, would you like to hear referees speaking to the players and hear the players? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would, I would be. A, <laughs> I am entertaining. I think what Alison said there. I, I've heard somebody shout on that actually have a chuckle <laughs> um, because you, 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 usually you can't hear them with the, the crowds and anything, but. I think the players would certainly be a lot more respectful to the referee if they knew what they were saying was going out live. So I think that would work both ways. Uh, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be saying what they're saying at the minute, the referees, because they'd probably get banned for a year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's been called into question. 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. Everybody would have to, you know, um, have a long hard think about what they're saying to the referee. Um, anyway, listen, uh, this week coming up, um, Dundee against Inverness Cali Thistle is tomorrow. Um, obviously, Charlie's going to miss out on that. And thanks for all the lovely messages. Just wishing Charlie a speedy recovery. Um, and let's hope he's uh, back fighting fit uh, over the next week to 10 days. Uh, on Wednesday, it's Hamilton Ackies against St. John's. Livingston against Rangers. We'll hear from uh, Stephen Gerrard on tomorrow's programme, as well as David Martin. Uh, Brian Rice and uh, of course we will hear from Callum Davison um, if Tam get up at half three after celebrating his 40th Callum Davison might just be getting up now surely um, mm -hmm. and who would deny him and all the St Johnson players um, the mother of all celebrations for that little bit of history which is absolutely fantastic I hope he keeps fantastic. celebrating Peter because you play hymns on Saturday yeah, keep writing, boys. <laughs> keep writing. Yeah, keep A um, couple of things downside, Ruffy. Paul Lambert, in the end, decided enough is enough. Um, he's away from Ipswich. Yeah, I think he knew it was on the cards. You know, new owners coming in. They, they'd already stated, you know, they were going to be big, big, big changes. I mean, it's only a couple of points off the playoffs. So, you know, the, it's not results that are getting them the stack. But I think Paul's been quite outspoken in the way the club should be run. And obviously the new owners don't agree with him. So, and unfortunately, that means you. But I think he's done enough down there to get another club. Yep, um, we shall see. I love um, to see Paul get another club. He's a good manager. I think he's got uh, something to offer. But sometimes when the board have one idea of which direction the club should be going in and you have another, and there were still, as you mentioned, there, there were only two points off the playoffs, um, maybe. Same as uh, Gary Colville the, with Thistle. Yeah, office. yeah, absolutely. And then the board yeah. just acted rough. He just put them right out the mm -hmm. door. It's unbelievable. You're right, Tom. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, the other thing I was going to say to you guys, um, interesting to see how it all pans out at Barcelona. Financial irregularities, arrests have been made. Um, there's a, a vote coming up for the new president of Barcelona. I think they're only something like £450 million in debt. But as long as they're able to service it, they can get on with it. Um, and I finished this programme on a sad note, Ruffy, because... Um, it was sad to see that 65-year-old Glenn Roder passed away. Um, I can remember from the early days, uh, you know, watching Glenn um, play football, QPR, Newcastle, Watford and Gillingham. He was Newcastle United's manager as well, managed a number of clubs, including West Ham. Um, it's always with great sadness that you see players that you remember from from the days of match of the day in the, in the 70s, 80s or 90s um, passing away. 65 is too young. Oh, it is far too young, there's no doubt about that, Peter. But he, he was another guy who was a manager, as you say, in Newcastle, but he was a manager that other clubs identified that he could get them out of trouble, you know, when they're done a relegation and they'd bring him in and he, he'd save them, you know. So, no, I think he'll have a, a lot of people down in England have a lot of sad memories or, or good memories of him, but not passing away at that age. Yeah, absolutely. Condolences to um, Glenn's family and friends. Thoughts and prayers with them as well. I know Darren Jackson tomorrow certainly will have some kind words for him. He was actually his teammate when Darren started as a youngster there at Newcastle United. Uh, this is all about football and the football show. Thank you to uh, every one of you for joining us on a regular basis. If you don't watch it live, the amount of people who are watching on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter later on at their own leisure is amazing. So thank you to everyone for following us on our Facebook and, of course, subscribing to the YouTube. If you get a chance, this week's one-to-one, -one, uh, well, I caught up with uh, Scott McDonald and got his thoughts on what he's doing now in Australia. Um, his career down there, his hopes to become uh, a coach a wee bit later on. Um, so it was an interesting one-to-one. -one. It's out on Wednesday morning. We've been doing uh, quite a number of these one-to-ones. Hopefully you enjoy them. Um, we'll have more and more people talking about their memories in football uh, over the forthcoming weeks. Try and interview as many as possible. And if you want to win yourself an Xbox, an iPad and a Diego Maradona canvas, then if you go to our Facebook page right at the top, there's a competition and a chance for you to get involved. Follow the instructions and you could be in with a chance of winning all three as one prize in our PLZ soccer hat-trick competition. Uh, all that remains for me to say is, great to see Tam with the birthday presents on show. He's now 40 years and a day old, uh, and he's up to celebrate the rest of Monday as well. Great to see him after the mother of all hangovers. Um, Alison had a few wines to celebrate uh, Tam's birthday, um, just because she can. And uh, Ruffy's going back to let his wife... 
Uh, Ruffy's going back to let his wife out of the cupboard um, uh, the next couple of hours. We'll tell you how that ends tomorrow. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.